Hi, hi everybody. I'm Wei Hua Huang, and uh, a lot of people are sharing personal stories about John, but I've only really interacted with him at the <clears throat> gatherings, where we do spend a lot of time chatting together because he and I, turns out, have something that we have in common that the other attendees don't have, which is that we get really bored of the presentations and like to go out to the lounge and just wander around and chat. But the story I want to share is this, one of the most valuable presents that John ever gave, which he gave me around the time I was born. And it's also, you know, one of the most valuable presents I've ever received because I got this about 10 years before I ever met him. And, and by the way, I don't mean valuable as in something like philosophical or intangible. I just mean money. It, it, it was extremely valuable in a monetary sense. And so I'm a high school student, and I'm, a, I'm like one of the top math students, according to some math competition. And I, I'm trying to like find a research paper, because apparently all smart kids have to like do research papers in high school instead of just doing puzzles and stuff. And uh, when, and I come across the book of Winning Ways. Let me go ahead and find it on the book, bookshelf here. Oh. No, he's wandering in the room. Am I uh, am I still am I still online? Well, so uh, can everyone still hear me? So I've got this copy of Winning Ways. I, it turns out that, and I'm looking through it, looking for some idea for a presentation to do here. And uh, let's uh, and. Uh, and I devour this, and it's really fun. There's all these games and stuff, but I really don't know what to research to do because this is all very hard math, and I'm just still sort of a high school student. So over here, if I can flip to the right place here, uh, I come across this little one throwaway line that he's got here on page 729 about the Peg Solitaire Army here. And you can see that it says, you know, the last line says, the two men with guns can be moved to the shaded places so as to obtain the only other arrangement. The solitaire army turns out that it's this complicated, it's, it's this math problem which, which has like, you know, where the more pieces you have, the harder it gets. And it has this really strange sequence that goes one, two, four, eight, twenty, 20, then infinity. So uh, in the case of 20, according to Winning Ways, there's only uh, two solutions. There's what, two arrangements. He shows one in figure 23, shows the other one. It's based on some work by John Beasley, who did some stuff in the 60s, who, um, who then reprinted, the, I, the puzzle, reprinted that particular problem that Conway came up with. And um, in his book, The Ins and Outs of Peg Solitaire. And I noticed when I was looking through this that John's two solutions were different than John Beasley's two solutions. And they both said that there were two solutions, but they weren't the same two solutions. So I said, huh, maybe there's something here. So I go and, so I go and write, write a paper. This is 1993. So, you know, I'm doing this on WordPerfect. The internet doesn't exist yet. I have to go to actual libraries to do research. And so the, uh, and so, I write out this paper, I try to come up with some generalizations of, as to whatever, you know, something that a high school student could do. I looked at my old paper recently, and it's stuff like, you know, I've got this 10, 20 page paper that turns out to be a lot of handwritten analysis of stuff that I could probably program these days and do in 10 minutes. But, <clears throat> but you know, it pro so I send it off to the uh, science talent search, which was run by Westinghouse at the time. And I guess maybe they didn't know deep math or something because they thought this, hey, this looks kind of impressive. And so they invited me to be uh, one of the 40 finalists in the world to be in this competition. And then at the end of it, I ended up being sixth place in the United States, winning a uh, scholarship of uh, $60,000. So all so I won so so I, I picked up basically a third of my college tuition, mostly because of that one little throwaway line that John wrote in Winning Ways. So um, so if if any of you are ever work, mathematicians working on your magnum opus, one piece of advice: if you really want to inspire some smart kids out there, don't double check your work. All right, that's the story I have to share. Thank you all very much for letting me tell it. Thank you, Eva. Uh, up next, Barry. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Am I on? Yep. Thank you. Uh, okay. Well, I first got to know John at a conference we were both at in December 1993. I, I'd known of him and had met him a couple of times 
uh, before that. Um, but um, as it happened uh, a couple of weeks before the, the meeting, I was looking at, at uh, Martin Gardner's book on, and looking at some Penrose tiles in, in this book. And it, um, it suddenly jumped out at me that the kites and darts tiles could be nicely thought of as shadows of, if you take a, a, a rhombus with a 72 degree angle um, and bend half of it out of the plane, then the shadow of the perimeter, uh, if, if you bend it to the right amount, becomes a kite. And if you bend it by the same amount past the, the vertical, the shadow becomes the, the, the dart. And it, it, uh, the, the key thing here is that um, uh, it took me a while to convince myself that the, the, the rules for putting Penrose tiles together was consistent with gluing these bent rhombi in space so that you wound up with sort of a three-dimensional chicken wire mesh whose shadow is the original Penrose tiling. And knowing that, that Conway would be at this, this meeting I was gonna go at, I thought I would tell him about it. And so I, I made up a little paper model of, of a Penrose tile with, the, with bent rhombi and took it to the conference um, at the opening uh, uh, cocktail party the, the, the night we all arrived. I, I took my model up and introduced myself and showed it to him and explained the idea. Um, I, I kind of expected him to, to say that's that's nice, but that's nice. But of course, you can you can do this. This is you know I sort of figured it was probably well known. But instead, he he took my model and looked at it, and he said two things. He he first said, "Well, that's quite lovely," and then he looked at at it, and and then it looked at me and said, "But of course, you did it wrong." And he proceeded to explain just off the top of his head that instead of taking a, a, the, the rhombus with the 72 degree angle and leaving half of it flat and bending half of it, it would be actually nicer to take um, a rhombi with, with a 60 degree angle, in other words, two equilateral triangles, and bend both halves out of the plane to a per appropriate amounts and again, the shadow would become the, um, the, the uh, appropriate kite or, or, or dart. Um, and in particular, um, uh, if you, where you have on a Penrose uh, tiling, um, you know, five kites that, that come to, together at, at a point, if you just draw the, um, uh, the, the diameters, I'll, I'll show you a, a little thing, you're actually looking straight down at the top half of an icosahedron. And, and this is kind of obvious when you know to look for it, but apparently it hadn't really ever been noticed before. So at the, the, the next morning, he came up to me and, and growled at me and he said, you owe me two hours sleep. I was up half the night thinking about your, your tilings and, and he had worked out his own proof that, that the, the rules for fitting Penrose tiles together was consistent with, with this mesh being a nice continuous type of, of, of surface. Um, so it was, it was sort of a nice thing to, to hear. It told me that I, you know, that this observation I made was, was actually in some way new, at, at least to John. It, it also told me that, um, uh, you know, Two hours is half a night's sleep, so it sort of said about how much he slept per night. So I think I'll stop it, it, with that and, and pass it along to the next person. Okay, thank you, Barry. Mm -hmm. um, just to explain, Bob has had a little issue with his earbuds, I think, so um, I'm, I'm going to step in a little bit here. Uh, Mike, no, sorry, George Hart. George. I'm here. Do you hear me? Do you see me? I can hear you. And see. Okay, and, and, and you see me. I'm going to try and share my screen. Is this coming through? Do you see a little PowerPoint presentation? It's coming, yes. Okay, um, so I want to just briefly give a concept for um, what I think of as something that would be a wonderful memorial for John Conway. Um, there's a lot of things I could say, 
but basically, I, I met John in the 1990s, uh, first at some art and math conferences uh, in Albany. Matt Friedman had organized. Uh, there's a picture of him uh, wearing a, a musical instrument sculpture that I had made, I had brought there. Um, it's something that you kind of bang on. It has an icosahedral symmetry, and it's hard to see, but there's two wires that go up to a little headpiece, and the sound just kind of conducts direct, directly into your head, and it's just kind of a fun uh, experience. But this, this sort of just shows the playfulness that John was like immediately jumping into this and, and enjoying it and trying it out, uh, and always just sort of willing to share himself and, and try new things. Um, at one of those conferences, he talked about uh, a notation for thinking about polyhedra in terms of transformations. Um, he had described a kind of notation where capital letters were polyhedra, like an I for an icosahedron, and little letters were transformations. And uh, he sort of started with Kepler's understanding of the Archimedean solids and uh, went from there. And uh, I was kind of impressed by that sort of picture it suggested that you can generate an infinite number of things. <clears throat> I went home and I wrote a little computer program, or a big computer program, that you could simply type in his notation, like STI, and that would show up on your screen. Uh, there are the stub truncated icosahedron, and then you can uh, generate 3D printed models, etc., cetera, um, <clears throat> and uh, used it to generate a bunch of sculptures, uh, sort of based on the, the whole family of transformations that he had described, and uh, did a number of trips to Princeton, uh, brought him things, showed him things, uh, Here's a picture of a CD sculpture I had made. Um, he saw this in the back of my car and he said, oh, can I have that? And in just a nice British kind of way. And I said, why, of course, if you want it, it's yours. And the, uh, we hung it up and it, it was in the, uh, the lounge, the, the math uh, lounge at, at Fine Hall for roughly 10 years. I don't know exactly. I have a, a new sculpture there now. Um, and uh, there's a typical sort of way I would load up my car before driving down to Princeton. Um, so what happened that was, I'm going to show you here, I don't know if this is large enough to read, but this is probably the most exciting email I've ever received in my life. Um, he sent me a note and said, why don't we write a book together? Um, and uh, just because he was such a, a genius and we had had so much fun together just talking about everything, this, this was just a wonderful project. Uh, so we spent about a year, I would go down to Princeton about one day a week, um, now, most of the time, we would just sort of, you know, have Chinese food or drink tea. Uh, we'd play with lots of models and puzzles and things that I would bring. Uh, we did some actual math. Uh, it didn't go very far. Mostly, I just remember this as really one of the greatest intellectual periods in my life, just spending a lot of time with them, talking about everything, having lots of fun. Um, <clears throat> the book never really got very far. We just wrote longer and longer versions of the table of contents. Um, but one thing I want to say that really excited him uh, was this idea of a polyhedral park. Um, so this is something Chris Palmer kind of alluded to, he had in the background behind him. Uh, but John really wanted to create an outdoor sculpture park where polyhedra would be the shape of lampposts and you could walk around and various paths with transformation. So this, this is a kind of a typed map that he had made and sent me. And uh, he had even found a possible sponsor. So he had asked me, the two of us, we went and visited uh, a millionaire who had a, a Fifth Avenue apartment overlooking uh, Central Park and tried to pitch the idea. Uh, it didn't go very far. Um, he, it revived it for a while, around 2012 or so, we discussed making some 3D printed models. Um, I'll show you the basic idea that here's a cube, this would be one lamppost. As you'd walk along a path of truncation, uh, the paths would get, uh, would, the lamppost would, show various stages on the way uh, to an octahedron, and then pyramids would pop up as you continue along a different path of elevating, um, and you come back to the cube. Um, <clears throat> and this idea was to, to make an actual physical park that would show people some of the beauty of, of polyhedra and some of the mathematical ideas of transformation. Um, and so those pictures I showed you I had actually made into a flip book, and we, we showed them to the potential sponsor, um, but it didn't go anywhere. Anyway, uh, just the idea I'd like to plant a kind of a seed in people's minds uh, that if there was a, a way to sort of make a memorial John that would be kind of accessible to the public and uh, show something that he really found beautiful and playful. Um, uh, here you can see a drawing he had made of some of the paths in this polyhedral park at a talk he had given. Uh, this picture sort of shows my, my favorite way to think of John, just sort of very physical, having fun. You know, he brought these models from his office and taped them on the blackboard as he was giving the talk. Um, it's just sort of 
um, an idea I'd like to give people to think about. Um, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have a, a polyhedral park to, memor to memorialize John? That's it, thank you. Thank you, George. And Jane Gilman, you are up. Let me see if I can find you. First of all, I'd like to thank Bob for adding me at the last minute. Um, I work in a different field than, than John in, in Teichmiller theory, um, but I team taught an experimental math course with him along with Bill Thurston and Peter Doyle in 1991. And we taught it once in Princeton and once at the Geometry Center in Minnesota. And um, many of the things I have to say have already been said, but I wanna say something about the Minnesota course. There was a mixture of graduate students, undergrads, postdocs, and high school students. And the four of us who were teaching it thought it was a wonderful thing that we were doing. I don't know what the students actually thought, but when we were planning the course, we would talk far into the night about the next day's class and about mathematics. And at some point, John talked about his early years, which I don't think anyone here has talked about much, but he described his early life in a small town, which now I've come to see was Liverpool, not so small but he described himself as being pegged as an introverted math nerd. And he explained that when he left this small town for Cambridge University, he decided that he could assume any persona he chose, as nobody already knew him at Cambridge, and he chose to be outgoing, even flamboyant, and the center of attention from an an admiring crowd that often surrounded him. That is, he became the charismatic center of things. And I once saw him actually from a distance in 1969 being the center of a big group of, of mathematicians. So those who met him later would think of him as self-confident and assured but I remember once in 1991, after one team taught class, I criticized his concern for students and he cried. And I regret that I did that. I hardly knew him at that time. When I was preparing in 1994 to teach this geometry and imagination course at Rutgers, John made me a set of the cardboard five platonic solids and ever since they've hung on the walls of my office, except when I was using them in the classroom. But last spring they began to crumble and fall apart. And I think now that was perhaps an omen of the end of an era. So thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Jane. So um, Bob, I think you're, you're back on audio, correct? Okay. We have reached the end of our um, speaker list and thank you all very much for coming. This has been an amazing event, um, but I, we're, we're not done. Um, we wanna open it up to anyone who wants to say anything who wasn't on the speaker list. Um, I think probably uh, Glenn Whitney has said he has something to share if he's ready. And uh, anyone who wants to say something, um, send me a message or just send a message to everyone and we'll sort of, we'll sort of queue you up. But let's, let's move now to Glenn if he's ready. Yep. Hi, yeah, so I didn't, uh, well, I think like most of us, I had many fewer uh, personal interactions with John Conway than, than I would have loved to have had. Uh, but one was that it felt to me several times to uh, have the privilege of being his driver uh, for a couple of trips back and forth to Manhattan. And I can tell you, uh, I think those are the least dull drives of my entire life. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, we would talk about this and that. And at one point he just said, I started talking about how, you know, it wasn't uh, too long into my career that I started to develop a sort of reputation. And he didn't elaborate, but I, but I think I kind of knew what he meant. And he said, it wasn't so much longer after that that I began to realize 
that I had this reputation, okay? And uh, then he said, and it wasn't so much longer after that that when I would be in a situation where I felt like I should do something but I wasn't quite sure what to do, I would just ask myself, what would John Conway do? And that's how I would decide uh, what to do. And, uh, you know, I think if it was good enough for John, it could be good enough for the rest of us. So uh, next time you're not quite sure how to proceed, just ask yourself, what would John Conway do? And give that a shot. That's all. Thank you, Glenn. Um, I see that Mike Stranahan has um, managed to um, log in. So, Mike, if you are ready, we will go to you now. Okay, thank you so much. And my story is briefly told. We have to go back to 2002. We have to go to Toronto, Canada. We have to go to the Fields Institute of Mathematics. And I'm going to start my video so you can see me. Um, God, <laughs> is that worth it? The, um, the purpose, there was an event at the Field Institute, and I was there. And the event was the installation of a hyperdodecahedron, which is a four dimensional dodecahedron, simple, six feet in diameter at the Fields Institute, hanging in the main hall and lit by lights and spinning slowly. It really was very beautiful. And the designer was there at the Fields Institute, Mark Pelletier, and his wife, Amina Allen. And I was um, just uh, come along. So we're getting to the point where everybody is in a lecture hall at the Fields Institute. And the whole purpose is to pay tribute to Donald Coxeter, the, the father of modern geometry. And so um, people are getting up and speaking. And then finally, John Conway got up and spoke. And he, said, he began his remarks by saying, you know, I think the first thing I want to say is that Donald Coxeter, sitting right here, to my left, whom we are here to honor, once tried to kill me. Audible gasp from the audience, stunned silence. What was this man meaning? So John waited kind of a pregnant pause. And then he said, well, of course, he didn't quite succeed. It happened when I was attending a lecture and at the lecture, Coxeter was speaking, and Coxeter posed a mathematical problem that was so interesting that it absolutely took over my mind. And instead of listening to the lecture, I just thought about the problem. And then when the lecture was over, I got up out of my chair and I was thinking out about the problem. I walked out of the lecture hall and I was thinking about the problem. I started to walk across the street and I was thinking about the problem. And of course, I didn't see that truck coming towards me. And the truck hit me, didn't kill me. But I've always been able to say that Donald Coxeter tried to kill me. Hilarious and delighted applause from the audience. And a wonderful moment. And thank you, John Conway. And thank you all. And thanks for letting me in. And thank you, Higher Power. We were, we were privileged to have known him. Thank you, Mike. That's a great story. Um, up next, uh, Tanya, I believe, Tanya Kavanova, I assume, um, would like to speak, if you're ready. Hello. Do you see, uh, do you see me? Yeah. I don't see yeah. myself. You're on. Yep. I visited um, John in, uh, at Princeton and um, 
he was uh, uh, dismantling his office. He was told that his office was a fire hazard and he has, has to remove all this polyhedra that was uh, around his office, uh, uh, putting them in the garbage bags. So ask him to give me his favorite toy. So I wanna show you. He gave me this. Do you see it? Yes. Well, he made it himself, so this is it. Thank you. Ah, sorry, I wasn't looking for raised hands. Okay, Colin, you're unmuted. Okay. Uh, a very brief recollection. Um, I sent Conway my um, my undergraduate thesis when I was thinking of applying to Cambridge, and it was only when I arrived at Cambridge much later that I discovered that, in fact, he never opened his post, so uh, he never got my thesis. Uh, but when I arrived at Cambridge, I um, I did ask, uh, you know, where's Conway? And somebody pointed at the other end of the room, saying he's down there with the beard, the sandals, and the acolytes. Uh, so I decided I wouldn't. Uh, become one of the acolytes in that sort of way. But uh, I did end up meeting Conway when I was wheeling my unicycle down the street and, uh, and he came running after me. Uh, quite a few people uh, ended up being quite envious of this idea that Conway would actually run after me. And I don't remember what it was that he asked me. I was so shocked. But that was my first meeting with Conway and we ended up playing backgammon a lot in the department. He didn't play backgammon much with other people, but I played um, a very weird style. I would play an extreme back game, an extreme front game, an extreme running game, constantly switching between. And he found that intriguing to try and find a way of, uh, of, of countering the extreme forms that I would I'd, uh, flail between. Because he wasn't so much interested in winning, he was interested in a, a game that was fun. And that was, of course, uh, the main thing about John was that he was always interested in something that was fun and finding what went on inside that. So that was my experience of John. I met him many times afterwards, you know, and uh, in many conversations, uh, which enriched my life enormously. And I'm just so sad that it's not going to happen again. Thanks very much. Thank you, Colin. Um, Glenn Smith has a quick memory to share, he says. All right. I had a chance, thanks to Siobhan, to spend some time with Conway in several different locations. The first time I was at Coxeter's house, and I understood how much Coxeter appreciated Conway and vice versa. Then later at the Coxeter Legacy um, in Princeton, I had a chance to spend some time with John at his house, and he was so very gracious. I shared an idea that I had on a uh, how how you move a cube octahedron into a aromic triconohedron, and so we went through the model, and out of that came this uh, octa bug, as we called it, uh, with the coordinates of the various structures you, one could make. And at the end of this meeting, he said the nicest thing to me because uh, he had been quite excited about the movements that we were doing with the uh, with the you know, flexible cube octahedron, and I don't have the model here with me because we were just talking through it. But he said, I consider a good day when I learn something new. And when he shook my hand and he said, I want to thank you for a good day. So I always remember that I got a chance to get some one-on-one -on -one time with him and he was very, very gracious. Of course, his ability to think through problems was second to none. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, I have a message that uh, David has a few anecdotes to share. I'm not sure, David, who, but I will unmute you and we will find out. Are you ready, David? I am unmuted, it says. Can you hear me? Oh, David Singmaster, welcome. Right, right. Uh, I guess most of you know I'm settled in England since 1970 and at that time I met Conway 
and I used to go up to Cambridge to the common room and be amazed by the junk that had piled up in his um, office. But um, I have, um, I got involved with the London Mathematical Society and at dinner after one of the meetings, Conway had been the speaker and he held forth about the calendar, which was really quite fascinating because he, we know, think of calendars as a mathematical problem, but he had studied the problem of the change from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar. And he had actually gone and looked up the act of parliament, which um, in 1752, and it turned out to be immensely complicated. It didn't, didn't just involve skipping 11 days, but the problem is all the saints whose holidays fell during the period of involved had to be reallocated. Some of them were omitted, some of them were moved ahead 11 days, some were completely moved. Um, so I spent a long, evening listening to John's uh, exposition of all the problems. But uh, in um, the middle middle 70s, I was at the conf British Combinatorial Conference in Cambridge and I got assigned to chair a session which Conway was in. And he arrived a little bit late and he said, I think I've got an hour. And I didn't have the nerve to say he only had half an hour. And at the end of half an hour, he was in full flow. And I don't know if any of you have ever had the, well, the duty to try to cut off John Conway in the middle of a lecture. And nobody else in the room wanted to stop either. So we let it go on for an hour. Uh, and another incident, he was giving a talk to the Royal, in, Royal Institution. And I was asked to do a display of puzzles for the talk. And I came in with a couple of boxes of puzzles and put them out of display and so on. And, John came over to me and said, um, David, would you mind taking my girlfriend out to dinner? I thought this was a bit strange, but it turned out he hadn't checked. And the dinner that he was being given in the Royal Institution was around Michael Faraday's table. And this all had a fixed number of seats and he hadn't bothered to ask if he could bring his girlfriend along. So I had to take his girlfriend out to dinner, which was a rather pleasant, uh, unexpected pleasure. Anyway, that's just some of my personal contacts with John. Thank, Thank you, David. David. Um, let's go now to Rosie. Um, I believe this is uh, Rosie Conway, if I'm, if I'm correct. Yes, that's right. I'd just like to thank you all for this wonderful, wonderful tribute. I've been glued to it for the last, well, I guess three and a half hours, but I'm going to have to go now <laughs> because it's getting on for 3 a.m. here in, in, in England. And I, uh, yeah, real life's going to hit me, I guess, in the morning, though it's a rather unreal life now. Um, for coronavirus and for losing my wonderful father. And um, it's so gratifying to know and to have seen just a f and heard from a few of the people who hold him in such high esteem. Thank you very much for this. And I'd like to look at it again at leisure. So I, I hope I'll be able to do that. Thank you all very much. Good night. Thank you so much, Rosie. And yes, we do. We are recording it and we plan to share the recording. It will take some processing time, but uh, we'll make it available. 
And thank you. Thank you so much for joining. Good night. And oh, I'm told that um, Diana wants to speak. I had not seen that. So um, Diana, um, I'll put you on right now. Hi, everyone. You know, I was afraid this was going to be too sad, but I've really, really enjoyed it. And I've listened to everything everyone said, and it hasn't made me sad. It's made me really, really happy. And um, just like Rosie said, it's, it's really, really gratifying to see how much John touched so many people. And I'm sorry our son's gone to bed, but he was on for a little while too. Um, you know, John's in the room, by the way, just so you know. He's on the shelf. So thank you, everyone, so very much. Thank you so much, Diana. We, we really uh, appreciate you all joining, appreciate you joining us all and we're, we're touched. Paul, are you ready to say a few more words? Yeah, although I don't, I don't know what to say after that, what Diana said. <laughs> yeah. I think what John Conway taught me personally was everybody gets to have their own math. You can go as far out as you want it, and, and, it's, and it's just fun, you know? That's all these, all the mathematicians that are speaking tonight and the artists. And I, I, you know, I hate to differentiate, but they're all talking about having fun, you know, and that was certainly my experience of Conway. And I think, you know, I, I hate to paraphrase Max Planck, but I, I would say this about mathematics. It advances funeral by funeral, but I'd say it in the best light with, with John, because when he died, he sort of opened up math to everybody i mean the 20 21st century math is math anybody can play with and have fun in. and i think that's a wonderful thing it's a great legacy so i guess that's what i have to say thank you paul uh rebecca mercury um are you ready yes i am great yes hi thanks for recognizing me this has been an amazing evening um we're coming up on, this is our 40th year of the Princeton Association of Computing Machinery, IEEE Computer Society. And I've been on the board uh, for most of that time. So we, at some point, came across the, um, uh, you know, John Conway, who gave a keynote address for one of the IEEE banquets, and that's where I first met him. It has to have been in the 90s. And, um, and then we just, you know, all of us, you know, those of us who knew him, Roger Toby, who I know is on um, watching tonight, too. Um, we got to know him. He was just so generous with his time. And that's what the thread I'm hearing from all of this. Um, Roger and I, Roger, more, much more than me, but I would occasionally go also with Roger um, to that hallway, this famous hallway in Fine Hall. And if he was there, you could talk to them and, you know, engage in conversation. And we would also um, many times ply him with food. Um, I heard Tomo Sushi mention many times, you know, this was one of, you know, his favorite places. And if you bought him a meal, he'd be very happy to uh, give a talk for our organization. And so we had the, um, the Gardner Celebration of Mind, which was an outgrowth of the G4G events. And we were holding those annually and, uh, and Conway would come and, you know, give like a 15 or 20 minute talk, just a pre-talk to our computer graphics show and, you know, bring members of the family and that sort of thing. And it was just a really wonderful opportunity for him to be there. He shared with us so much, so many hundreds and hundreds of people got to hear him just in these short lectures and occasionally longer ones at the banquets and things. Um, but there was one memory in particular that I wanted to mention, and this is sort of fitting for the end of all of um, these great, wonderful recollections. Um, there was one of these times where, you know, we were eating together outside. It was a very hot day. I remember it was, um, we were outdoors near uh, one of the, the ice cream parlors. He loved the ice cream parlors as well. And just sitting there and he was musing about all of the many things he had worked on. By then he had won so many awards and all of his great publications. And, and he started saying to me that 
that he came to the realization that everything he had worked on was really just a variation of the same thing. And he seemed very distressed by this. And I said, you, do you really believe that? They're just so diverse in all of these ideas. And he was very despondent, actually, and really felt that it was all the same thing. It was all working out the same problem. Um, and he felt that he was, <laughs> I mean, how, how he could say this, but he felt that he was not tremendously creative because he was always working on the same problem. But, you know, of course, uh, what all of this discussion attests is, you know, the amazing insights that he had. And I, I guess I'm leaving this as an open question. Um, did he ever write down the connectivity? You know, at first I thought he was just pulling my leg, but, but he really insisted that he really believed this. And I, maybe someone will find this in his papers or maybe someone will be able to demonstrate the connectivity of all the things that he worked on. But I do wonder about that. And I also do understand why it might have made him sad, but he shouldn't. Be. So thank you very much, John. And thank you very much, all of you, for, for having this great evening and, and remembering him. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Lucas Garone, are you ready? Yeah, so I had the privilege to meet Conway a few times because he still traveled lots of places. And, and <laughs> one of those was a Canada USA math camp, where he would still go every year to just talk with students and he was always generous with his time and I knew this was the math camp to go to because of course Conway went there and um, I learned a few things I would never be able to hear anywhere else and uh, many people know me for Rubik's Cube stuff and he told me about a bit of the very early history and he told me you know when I lost interest in in those kinds of puzzles was when the 4x4x4 four by four by four came out because there would be variation after variation after variation and there would never be any end of it. So he stopped doing that and he left all that big area of math open for us. And there's still a bunch of nice, low hanging unanswered fruit. So um, I guess I'm thankful that he, he did enough to get that started and stepped out of the way for us to still do some of it. Thank you, Lucas. Um, Danny Slater wanted to speak next, I believe. Are you ready? Yeah. Hi. Um, so, I mean, <clears throat> uh, I'm a professor at, at Carnegie Mellon. I spent a semester at Princeton uh, in the early 90s, I think maybe 1991, when they were doing the um, ge Geometry and the Imagination course with Bill Thurston and, and, um, and Conway, and they were doing, and, and Peter Doyle, and they were doing this amazing course. And I got to know all of them, and I ended up writing a paper with Bill Thurston. But um, I was, uh, you know, I spent some time with Conway as well, and uh, one time my dad was visiting, and um, I, I introduced him to John Conway. He went to the this, this his lab in, in Fine Hall, which was all, all the, you know all the models and all that stuff, and all the students were hanging out in there. And he made this thing for my dad, and unfortunately, I lost it. I don't have it anymore. But during this meeting, I, I decided to make it myself, and I made one. I have it right here. I'll show you in a second. It's an optical illusion that um, Conway made, and and he gave it to my dad. So here, here, here it is. I don't know if it's going to work for you guys. So here we have just a cube, right? But when I twist it, it's going all the wrong way. I don't know if you, I don't know if it's how you're perceiving it, but it looks like it looks like a con. It looks like the front corner is sticking out toward you, but actually, that's not what it is. It's it's the other way. <laughs> so so anyway, this is something that. Uh, that John John Conway uh, showed me and my dad. It was really really cool, and he gave, he gave the uh, the model uh, to 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 my dad. So uh, that's my story about John Conway. Thank you, Danny. Very fun. Uh, Neil Calkin, are you ready? I am. Uh, I just wanted to say that John was the most amazing speaker that I have ever seen. He could take any concept and explain it to any audience be it a PhD mathematician or a five-year-old child. And I would come out of listening to him speak with an almost visceral understanding of whatever topic he had been speaking about. And it was fantastic. And it would last for about 30 minutes. It was like Chinese food. I would be hungry again 30 minutes later and I could not reconstruct my understanding that he had left me with. And that is the thing I miss most about John. Thank you for running this, Bob, and everybody. Thank you, Neil. 
Well, this has been um, incredible. Um, I think uh, we've, we've been blessed to have uh, an amazing set of speakers and this amazing opportunity. It's been, uh, we're four hours in now <laughs> to sharing our memories. And, um, you know, I think Don alone could still be talking <laughs> if, if, if I hadn't stopped him. Um, we could go uh, on forever. If I could interrupt. Um, yes. I, yeah, um, I'm going to stop the recording, but I think that I'll uh, change the, the rules so that it will allow people to unmute themselves. So that would allow people to just speak up if they have more to say. But we're going to uh, leave that part out of the recording. So thanks, everybody, for coming. It's been, you know, a, an amazing four hours. Thank you, Frank. And let, yeah, thank you to Frank Ferris, who is actually hosting the Zoom session, and to Scott Gortman for co-moderating, and to, to Stacy with uh, the, the BAM organization.